Hey friends and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're going to look at a machine learning algorithm known as k-means clustering. We will see how we can apply that to well log data and split it up into separate groups. But before we get onto the practical side of running through k-means clustering in Jupyter Notebooks, we first must understand what k-means clustering is. Clustering is an unsupervised machine learning process, which learns from the data itself rather than from labelled examples as you would expect within supervised learning. It splits the data into distinct groups based on the features that are supplied to it. There are a number of clustering methods available, such as dbscan, Gaussian mixture modelling, and also k-means clustering, which is going to be the focus of this video. The main objective of the k-means clustering algorithm is to reduce or minimise the sum of the distances between the centre of the cluster and the other data points. So let's have a closer look at how k-means clustering actually works. To illustrate the process of k-means clustering, we can use a simple data set plotted on a scatter plot. The first step in the process is to define the number of clusters that we're going to want to generate. There are a number of ways that we can identify the optimum number of clusters and we will see an example of one of these methods in the Python tutorial section. So to keep things simple for illustration, we're going to work with three clusters, which means that the k in k means is equal to three. So after defining the number of clusters that we want, our next step is to select k random points within our data set. In this case, we are going to be selecting three random points. These selected points will form the starting point for our clusters. We can then calculate the Euclidean distance between the cluster center point and all other points. If we take this point here, for example, we can see that it is closer to the red cluster compared to the green and yellow clusters. As a result, it gets assigned to the red cluster. We then repeat this process with all other points on the scatter plot until they have been assigned to an appropriate cluster. After all the points have been assigned to a cluster, we can then calculate the mean point of each cluster, which are represented here by the axes. After the new mean points have been calculated, we can then repeat steps 3 to 5 and check if the points belong to the same cluster or to a different one. As we see here, a few points have changed their colour, as they are now closer to different mean points. Once the points have been reassigned, we can then recalculate the mean point and repeat. Eventually, we will reach a point where the mean points of the clusters do not change, and then we have our final clusters. And this is just a very simple illustration of how k-means clustering works. Now that we have the basics of k-means clustering covered, we can now go to our Jupyter Notebook and see how we can apply k-means clustering from the sklearn Python library to some well log data. So let's go over to our notebook and get started. In this tutorial, we are going to see how to run a simple k-means clustering on some well log data. Don't worry too much if you're not familiar with well log data. The same process can be applied to other data sets. So the first step is to import the main libraries that we're going to be using. We will be using pandas, which is commonly imported as pd. And this will be used to load data from a CSV file and also view our data. We then have our import matplot.py plot as plt and this is the main plotting library that we're going to be using to display our results. And finally we have the main library and modules we will be using for our machine learning process. These are the standard scalar from sklearn.preprocessing and k-means from sklearn.cluster. Once our libraries have been imported we can then move on to loading the data. The data we are using today is a single well from a much larger dataset that was used for a machine learning competition hosted by Zeek and Force 2020. You can find a link to the full dataset and the competition details in the description below. To load in our data we will call upon df is equal to pd.read underscore csv and then we pass in the location and the file name. To make things easier for us and to make it easier to work with our data, I'm going to set the index column to depth underscore md. And this is just the measured depth that has been acquired along the wellbore. And once we've run that, we can check our contents by calling upon the data frame or the df variable. And then we can see that we have our measurements from each of the logging tools. We have our row b, which is our bulk density, gr, which is gamma ray, n5, which is our neutron porosity, PEF, which is photoelectric factor, and DTC, which is acoustic compressional slowness. As we can see from the data frame, we have a series of NANs in, within our data, and this means not a number or missing values. And many machine learning algorithms can't handle the missing values, so we have to either repair them or remove them. 
And in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to remove them and just to keep things simple. I have done a video previously looking at various ways to fill the data using pandas. You can check that out on my channel if you're interested. So to drop our missing values, we can call upon df.dropna and in the brackets we'll set the argument in place is equal to true. So rather than creating a copy of the data frame, what we're going to do is apply this function dropna to the actual data frame here. And now if we look at our data, we can see that some of the rows have disappeared. So the debt value of 494.528 is now no longer within the data frame. And we can see that we don't have any NANs within here. And we can further confirm this by calling upon the describe method. And we can see that the count is equal for all of the individual columns within our data frame. And this just indicates that there are no missing values. So the next step within our process is to transform the data. So before we apply our k-means clustering algorithm, we need to standardize the data. As our data set contains features that have been measured in their own units and have their own data ranges, some features may end up having more influence over the final results compared to others. To reduce this impact, we need to take each feature, subtract the mean of that feature from each value, and then divide it by the feature's standard deviation. So we can see, for instance, that if I call upon the new data frame here just to get our values above this df.describe method, we can then have a look at the values and how this process works. So we have the first value here within the row B column, which is 1.77, and then we have a mean of 2.1499, and we also have a standard deviation of 0.25. So what we do is we take 1.77 and take away the mean from that, and then that result is then divided by the standard deviation. And then this is repeated for each of the measurements within this column. Once that's been done, it will then be applied to the other columns within this data frame. So let us apply the, the standard scalar. So first we have to create an instance of the scalar. And we can do that by typing scalar is equal to standard scalar, open brackets. And that will initialize the class. So then we need to fit that standard scalar to our data and then transform our data using that scalar. What we need to do is, within our data frame, I prefer to have those curves or those outputs put back into the data frame rather than having them as an independent array. So what I've done here is I've added the curves with an underscore uh, T to, to say that they've been transformed, set that up as a list within the data frame object. So this is going to add new curves to our data frame. Then over on the right hand side, well, we need to call upon scalar and then we call upon this method called fit underscore transform and then we pass in our data frame with our original curves that we want to transform. So we can run this, and then when we view our data frame, we can now see that we've got our row B underscore T, N phi underscore T, etc. here in the data frame, and we also have our original values. So why am I doing this? Well, it just makes things easier when we come to plotting. So if I had done this without applying it back to the data frame, we would be working with a NumPy array we would then have to work out how to bring that back into the data frame, which can be done with a few lines of code, but this is probably, the, in my opinion, is the simplest way to do that to bring it into the data frame. Now we're going to move on to actually applying the k-means clustering to our data. But you may have one important question that you're asking, and that is how do we know how many clusters to initialize our algorithm with? You would have seen in the presentation at the start that we, we need to provide a number for k to begin the process of clustering. There are a number of methods we can use to identify the optimum number of clusters. And the one that I'm going to show here involves a plot known as an elbow plot. And to keep things simple for visualization later on, we're just going to work with two variables, n phi underscore t and rho b underscore t. So the simple idea behind this function is we run our k-means algorithm multiple times and plot the inertias, which is simply a measure of the sum of the square distances to the nearest cluster centre. As the number of clusters increase, the inertia will decrease, and there will be a point in this plot where the value will go from a large change between clusters to a very small change between clusters. It is at this point that we have an idea of what our best number is for starting our k-means algorithm. So with this function, I've got two lists that are being created here, means and inertias, and then we're going to loop through k, so we're going to range from 1 to max k, which is our argument here, so we can pass in any number here and it will loop through that 
until we reach the maximum number of k. And then we're going to apply the k-means algorithm and then fit that algorithm to the data. And then we append the inertias to our list as well as the k number to our means list. And then we're just going to generate the elbow plot down here by just creating a simple matplotlib figure uh, showing their number of clusters versus inertia. So to keep things simple for visualization, we're just going to work with the two variables, n phi underscore t and rho b underscore t. And then we're going to pass in 10 for our maximum number of clusters. So let us run this function. Once it's run, we then get back this elbow plot. And we can see that we've got our inertia up here on the y-axis and the number of clusters here on the x-axis. So here we've got cluster 1, which has a high inertia, which means that the sum of the squared distances between the cluster centre and the points is very, very high. As we move into two clusters, we then reduce that number uh, for our inertia down significantly to around about 6,000. And then, as you can see, we've, got a now, we've now got a gradual decline in our inertia as we move along. We could select our point here at two clusters, or we could potentially select three clusters as that slope is getting more and more gradual as we go above three clusters. So two clusters might be just a bit simplistic for this kind of data, so I'm going to go with three for this, this data set. So now that we have our initial value for k, we can then create a new variable called k-means, and that is going to be equal to k-means, which is our algorithm that we've imported from sklearn, and then we're going to set the n, so the number of clusters, or n clusters, is equal to 3. So now that we've initialized our k-means clustering algorithm, and we've set the, k, the number of clusters, or the k value, to 3, we now need to apply that to our data, and we can do that by calling upon k-means, dot fit, and then we're going to pass in the data frame, and then from that we're going to select our two curves, which will be n phi underscore t and rho b underscore t. So that is the k-means algorithm fitted to our data. Let's view the output of this, and what we can do is we can just create a new column within our data frame, and we will call this k-means underscore free, and we will set that equal to k-means dot labels and we need to add the underscore at the end here and then when we view our data frame we now see that we've got k means underscore free in our data frame and we can also see that we've got different numbers here so we've got a number one for these data points up here and we've also got a number two for these data points uh, down here at the bottom of the data frame it's all good and well knowing that we've got the data within our data frame uh, as a column but it doesn't really tell us much about our data, but just by looking at these raw values. So what we need to do is actually plot the results. And we're going to display a scatter plot of our density neutron data. And we can do that by simply calling upon plt.scatter. And then we add an x is equal to df n phi. So we'll have our n phi curve on the x axis. And then we have the y axis, which is going to be equal to df and that will be row B. We will also set the color argument C to equal to our new k-means column. And we just call upon df and then pass in k-means underscore free. For tidying up our plot, we can then set up the x limits and we will set that from minus 0 0.1 to 1 and plt.ylim to uh, go from 3 to 1.5 and then we'll do plt.show. And now we have our density neutron crossplot divided up into different clusters. And we can see that we've got one cluster down here in the bottom left, and then we've got one in the middle, and then we've got another cluster up here in the top right. So if you're familiar with reading these density neutron crossplots, we generally have our cleaner intervals down here uh, towards the matrix points of 2.65 for our sandstone or 2.71 for limestone. And then as we move up here towards the right, we get into the shellier intervals, and same with up here, um, which could also be from shallower intervals, as we've got quite a, a large range of data, going from shallow to deep. Just for a bit of fun, if we want to see how the k-means clustering algorithm splits this data up using different k values, we can simply create a little for loop, so we'll go for k in range. So we're going to go between one and six, and then what we're going to do is run the k-means algorithm again, so similar to our optimization uh, function, and we're going to set that to k-means, and we'll set n 
underscore clusters is equal to k and we just need to change that back to a capital M and then we'll do k means dot fit and then we pass in our data frame and also our transform data so we'll call upon Roby underscore t and nphi underscore t and then we will add our new curves back to the data frame and we will need to create a formatted string by just putting an f at the start and we type in k means underscore and then the curly braces uh, followed by the, the single quote and within the curly braces we can then pass in the k number so that we automatically add a new new column to the data frame with the incremental number or the number representing the number of clusters and we will set that to k means dot labels underscore so that's that being done so if we call upon our data frame now we can now see that we've got k means underscore three from our original one and then we've got k means underscore one two three four and five so let, let's use matplotlib to create some subplots so we'll create some we'll create fig and then axs is equal to plt dot subplots n rows is equal to one with the number of columns equal to five and we'll also set the fig size as equal to 20 by five this declares the size of the figure so next we need to go through a little for loop so for i and then ax in enumerate and then we're going to enumerate over fig dot axes so all of the individual axes within our subplots and we will also set the starting value to one so when you generally use enumerate it starts from zero but you can use this keyword argument start to specify the starting number so if we go through this loop it's going to start from start counting from one and then we just type in axe dot scatter and we'll just copy what we had above so where we've got x is equal to neutron porosity and then y is equal to row b and then over here on the, the color. So what we need to do is change the KM to capitals as that's what we've used within our data frame. And then here we need to put in the curly braces and we will use a value of I. So that is going to get the number from the current loop. So as we're using AX rather than PLT, we need to change the syntax slightly. So AX dot set Y limb. And then we pass in the values of three to 1.5 and then ax dot set x limb uh, going from 0 to 1 and then we'll set the title ax dot set underscore title and then again we use a formatted string so f and then open quotes n clusters colon and then we pass it in our curly braces with the value for i and then we'll just close that out and here we have our final subplots with the n clusters going from one up to five. See going from one cluster where everything is just the same, which we would expect with one cluster. And then as we go up to n clusters is equal to two, we can then see we've got a single division between the cleaner interval down here and our shellier data up here. And the clusters become smaller and smaller as we go along as the number of clusters increases. So this is where it would take some domain expert knowledge to understand whether the k-means clustering alg algorithm has been applied correctly. So this was just one example of k-means clustering, but there are a number of other different methods, and you can see examples of these on the sklearn or the scikit-learn website. And you can see here we've got Gaussian mixture modeling, we've got dbscan, and we've got many other different methods. And you can see from this image here how each of these methods split up that data. So instead of importing k-means, we can import one of these other methods and then apply it to our data. So if you've enjoyed today's video, be sure to click that like button. And also, if you want to see more content from this channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button and ding that notification bell. So thanks for watching, and until next time, bye for now.